Um, so John Swartley is the Associate Vice Provost for Research and the Managing Director of the Penn Center for Innovation. Uh, John, thanks so much for, for being here and why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on at PCI? Hey, thanks Danielle. Uh, it's nice to see you and everyone else if uh, only yet again on a computer screen. Um, I think the last time our respective organizations did this particular event, it was in person. So um, I've definitely got yeah. our collective fingers crossed for, for, for next time. Um, I, think, I think it's looking promising. So not gonna I think be so. Any, but uh, yeah, next time. Uh, at any rate, I'm, I'm really pleased that PCI is partnering again with PACT uh, on this event. Uh, it's a great event. It's, uh, you know, happens during Philly Tech Week. Um, and, you know, I know we, you know we, we, we've done this to showcase innovative technologies and startups that are emerging in the region and specifically from Penn. Um, so that's, that's really great for our organization as well. We're uh, a longstanding proud PAC supporter and board member, and it's, you know, it's been great to work with you and Dean and, and, and others at PAC over the past decade uh, to highlight the city, the region for investors and entrepreneurs, as well as the, the regional and, and national impact that we all, we all make. Um, just to provide a little bit of perspective on um, kind of where, where we you know, really seek to exert you know, quite a bit of emphasis uh, in this sector. Um, the, the startup sector is and has become vitally important for the translation and commercialization of intellectual property generated at places like Penn. Um, and, and that impact uh, really just can't be uh, overstated or underestimated. I couldn't decide on which word, so I, I included them both. Uh, but really, you know, when we kind of look, look at the performance, uh, the technology transfer and the, you know, the business creation, more and more of that happens on, you know, by a spin outs. Um, and and the, those are the entities that are advancing technologies to the point where they're either uh, partnered, bought, or and, and, and taken to market. And what's interesting is as, the, as that space has evolved, more and more of those spin out companies are, are actually developing the products themselves without the need for large partners out, outside of the region. And I mentioned that because, you know, as, as the, this industry matures and as the importance of that, that kind of channel of innovation becomes more, more and more robust, um, it has significant regional um, in, in impacts. I mean, just for example, last, last year, last fiscal year, kind of the Penn affiliated startups that are mostly here, almost all of them stay local, received you know, over $600 million in venture capital and, and market um, you know, kind of investments. And, and most of that funding, as I said, stays local. It supports the regional economic development and job creation right, right, right here where, where we are. So it's you know as I said, I can't can't underestimate it and, and can't overstate how important that 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 is to to us. Um, so I, on on that very optimistic note, and I know that we've got some great presentations there. I, I wanted to specifically thank and introduce our investor panel for for joining us today. Um, this is a this is a, a very familiar group of investors for us. They have a front row to our efforts at PCI facilitating uh, startup creation and uh, our consistent supporters of our commercialization and spin out activities. So I hope you will all um, help me in welcoming our three in investor panelists for today. Um, first up, Barbara Schilberg, who is the CEO of BioAdvance. Um, next we have Emily hey, Foote. Oh, hey, hey Barbara. Uh, next we have Emily Foote, uh, principal at Osage Investment Partners. And um, last but certainly not least, Marguerite Haber, who's an associate at Osage University Partners. And because I think I said that right, I don't have to put any money in, into the kitty. I know you changed your name about, you know, maybe, maybe right, at the, right, right, right about the time we did the last one of these. So hopefully, hopefully I, I said all that right. And with that, um, welcome and thank you. And I'm going to turn uh, the mic back over to my colleague, Lori Ackman. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you, John, and welcome. It's wonderful to have everyone here, um, both the companies and our investor panel, and I'll echo John's thanks to PACT. Um, it's been wonderful to partner as part of Philly Tech Week for um, the last several years, and um, they're an important partner of our organization otherwise. Um, so thanks again, and thank you, John, for kicking us off. 
Um, but without further ado, um, I wanted to get to why we're all here. We're very excited about this group of companies, um, some of which are very new, some of which have been around a year or two, um, but all cutting edge and all putting a great um, face and reality on the innovation that's coming out of Penn, which um, you know can be hard to define, but certainly it's um, our, our startups that really help to do that for us. So um, I'd like to first introduce Cantius Therapeutics. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Matthew Hayes. I'm going to go ahead and scrub my sheet. I put this on. Um, so I represent Cantius Therapeutics. This is a, a joint startup of um, two professors here at Penn, myself and Dr. Bart DeYoung, as well as uh, Professor Robert Doyle at Syracuse. And together, working with uh, Neil Lemon at uh, PCI Ventures at Penn, we are leading experts in the neural control of food intake and body weight regulation, but also with an eye towards uh, trying to block emesis and nausea that is really an intractable problem for many diseases, including cancer and chemotherapy, uh, as well as pregnancy and many other diseases. Our leading target candidate uh, that we're antagonizing is the growth differentiating factor GDF15. Uh, and this is a cartoon schematic of some of the work that we've done in three different animal models showing that GDF15 is dramatically upregulated uh, from the liver in response to chemotherapy in these animal models. It targets a specific population of neurons that are only located in a very discrete region of the brain. This is a cartoon cross section of a rodent brain, and it acts on these areoposterima and nucleus tractus solitarius neurons. And importantly, when it acts on these neurons, it drives a profound suppression in food intake and body weight, but it does so at the expense of causing illness. And uh, we see this in various stages of nausea and emesis in these animals. So not to bore with too much data, but these are um, uh, mouse data showing that in response to cisplatin, this is perhaps one of the most widely used chemotherapy agents uh, known to man. We see a suppression in food intake and body weight. And importantly here on the graph on the right, uh, really a dramatic increase in um, the plasma circulating concentrations of GDF-15. When we model nausea in the rodent, they are not physiologically able to um, vomit. So therefore we use proxies and one that we use is centered right here in the middle of the graph. It's something that humans do as well. This is called pica behavior. And this is the ingestion of kaolin. Kaolin is a clay-like substance. It's analogous to humans drinking uh, mylanta or kaopectate in response to feeling ill. And what I hope you can appreciate is in response to GDF-15, or we could show this for cisplatin as well, we get this huge increase in kaolin intake in these rats. And this is also driven by a suppression in food intake. And together with other sort of correlative behaviors, we model this as a proxy for cachexia or anorexia as a consequence of illness. We also uh, then set out to create an antagonist uh, to block this action of GDF-15. Um, and many of the big pharmaceutical industry um, are after the same sort of goal. Um, we were acutely aware right in the beginning of 2017 of the discovery that the GFRAL receptor uh, in fact binds the GDF-15 compound. But to date, no other pharmaceutical company has been able to create an antagonist for the GFRAL receptor. And instead, all of the big pharma companies have utilized an antibody approach. And we could talk at length about why the antibody approach is suboptimal compared to a peptide-based antagonist that we were able to synthesize. And we called this antagonist GRASP. It stands for uh, GFRAL receptor antagonist from Syracuse and Penn. Not too uh, uh, hard to roll off the tongue either. Um, and what I hope you can appreciate here is in response to cisplatin, uh, uh, shown in this large gray graph here in the, in the center at six hours post cisplatin treatment. Again, we have this intake of kaolin in rats uh, in, uh, indicating that the rodents are feeling sick and ill and GRASP is able to block or attenuate that uh, kaolin response following cisplatin. So we are very uh, confident of the action of this drug gaining uh, access to the brain. And so we fluorescently have tagged this compound and what I hope you can appreciate, the GFRAL receptor here located in the area of Postrema 
is also being bound by the GRASP compound. And together with the behavioral data, we believe that this indicates uh, a means of, of blocking chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, as well as other stimulus of nausea and vomiting that's triggered by GDF-15 release. Our goal, disrupted a little bit by COVID pandemic, is now to try to secure some startup funding. We've not pulled this number out of our, our hats. We actually have a pitch for why this is compelling to get us to IND or initial phase one uh, development within approximately a little over a year. So I know I'm right at the five minute mark and I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, sure, could I, uh, this is Barbara. Uh, how do you deliver the peptide? How does it get to the brainstem? Fantastic question. So uh, you systemically inject it um, and it will gain access into circulation. It's quite um, water soluble. And the, importantly, that region of the brainstem that it acts on is outside of the blood brain barrier. It's a, a region of the brain oh. that's known as a circumventricular nucleus. And gotcha. that happens to be where these uh, GFRAL receptors are located. Um, but one sort of important point here is the antibody approach done by the pharmaceutical company that has a more difficult time penetrating into the nucleus tractus solitarius that's just underneath it, whereas our peptide can gain that access. So we kind of have a leg up in uh, penetrance compared to the antibody approach. And, and so I think you, second question is just, is the, the target then, is the receptor only in the brainstem? Is it, or is it elsewhere yes. in the body? It's quite remarkable how it is only located in the brainstem. Um, and uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, it has to heterodimerize with uh, another molecule called RET. And together, you only find the population of these very discrete neurons located just in that chemoreceptive region of the brainstem. Interesting. There's just a little bit more time. Why do you think the competitors moved away from a peptide approach into an antibody approach for this target? So I think it was twofold, um, and that's a great question. One is there the, the sort of antagonism that we've designed as a non-competitive antagonist that we stumbled on um, uh, in terms of its rational design. But the other is the, um, the antibody approach was originally designed as a treatment for obesity. And our, our major splash paper that came out just a year ago showed that it's really not going to be a target for obesity. Uh, because you can't really suppress food intake and body weight without making the animals um, vomit their brains out. But we, we saw that coming and we were able to flip it on its axis and basically look at it as a, a treatment uh, possibility for nausea and emesis, uh, as well as uh, cachexia, which to date there is no treatments for, um, instead of going after targeting obesity. Great, thanks. Do we have time for one more? I have all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Laurie or somebody will cut me off if, if it's wrong. Um, so is, have you shown, or do you know for sure that cachexia, regardless of what the condition is that caused it, is gonna be treated the same way? Or have you, is that well known? So this is a great, great question. It's only since 2017 has the receptor really been um, uh, known uh, in the oh. public domain. Um, but I can say where things, uh, for example, such as pregnancy-induced nausea and vomiting or hyperemesis gravitarum in pregnancy uh, is also associated with this huge uh, upregulation in circulating GDF-15 concentrations. Cancer tumor-bearing models, uh, so one of our young colleagues here has done his uh, thesis on that work, also produces a huge elevation in GDF-15 uh, concentrations. And so many of these drivers of nausea and emesis, including other models such as HIV, are associated with this real upregulation in GDF-15 concentrations. And uh, I think we're sort of at that new wave of this being a, a future pharmacotherapy target, but um, to date, we happen to be the only ones with this peptide uh, antagonist approach. Um, and, and I think that for other reasons that I could go into at length, um, really sets us up to be the leading target down the road compared to an antibody-based uh, approach. Okay, um, thank Thanks. you. I think um, great um, to have you, Matt, and time to move on to our next company. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Infini, Infini Fluid X.
can you all hear me? Hello? Hello? Yep, sounds great. Sounds great? Okay, good. Yep. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sagar. I'm the co-founder of uh, Infinity Fluidics. Okay. I'm the co-founder of Infini Fluidics. Um, our vision is to make uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing on a chip. And the reason why we are trying to do this is traditional pharmaceutical manufacturing, for example, if you look at a facility like this, it's like five to 10 football fields having all these different, different unit operations scattered all around, right? And the problem with a lot of um, the current pharma manufacturing is they are really expensive. For example, like, to manufacture a single drug product, it costs more than 1.5 billion. And even after FDA approval, it takes anywhere between five to seven years to get the drug product from initial approval to the market. And the second challenge is, is the scale up. In a sense, during the drug product development cycle, there are like phase one trial, phase two, phase three, a single technology is not used across the entire cycle. That means we are losing in a, in, in a way that we are losing a lot of time and we are losing a lot of resources in just addressing the scale up issues that meets the entire drug product development cycle. And the third problem that we see is a lot of these facilities are very centralized. For example, like COVID kind of situation where we need a distributed manufacturing facility. In a sense, we don't need to worry about supply chain log logistics, keeping everything at minus ATC like Pfizer COVID vaccine, right? So in a sense, the, the problem is like they're expensive, a lot of scale up issues and pretty much all all pharma manufacturing is very centralized. And what we have done is like for the past five years, our team at Penn, our goal is to come up with this technology where we can integrate microfluidic with semiconductor technologies. The reason is like, for example, if you look at the semiconductor technologies, like 50 years back, the computers used to be like as huge as like refrigerators, right? And these days we can use simple cell phones and they're just like similar to cell phones. Uh, they're, they're so miniaturized now, right? So our idea is like, can we, can we integrate, can we parallelize microfluidic technologies just like the way billions of transistors are parallelized in CPU chips? And what we end up doing is like we, like we parallelized thousands of these tiny microfluidic units. Like in a sense, what you are seeing here is like a small drop that is generated here, right? This small drop can encapsulate a cell can encapsulate a drug, can encapsulate a protein or a peptide of interest with all excipients, like for example, PLGA, polycaprolactone for drug delivery systems, or it could be for cell or it could be for, for um, mRNA therapeutics, like for example, like COVID-19 vaccines. In a sense, this is, not, this is not going to be like a drop, it's going to be like a precipitation unit where we can make like COVID vaccines, like for example, mRNA lipid nanoparticles, right? So we combined microfluidics and semiconductor techniques and we came up with this simple chip Right. For example, if my video is live, I'm not sure. Um, if you can see this, the chip is like, this is the chip size. Uh, you, you can see here, like it, it's, it's, you can fit it in the hand. And this chip, um, uh, this chip can make uh, drugs that, that can meet the entire drug product development cycle. On, in, in a way, we can go from either 100 ml per hour or 100 liters per hour. And right now we file like five, pending PCT patents at Penn. And the technology, during the development of the technology, we got funding from GSK and we got funding from NSF for this work. And so if you look at this kind of like, for example, either factory on a chip or GMP on a chip, so it, it addresses all the pain points that the current pharma industry faces. It's very inexpensive. Like the way, the more we make these chips, the price is going to drop, right? For example, just like your cell phones. The more cell phones we make, the cost of the electronics is going to drop. And to just like, for example, the top layer is so modular, we can easily design in less than one to two weeks to make different drug products. Like for example, I want to make a lipid nanoparticle, just change the top layer and we can make lipid nanoparticles. I want to make a microparticle, just change the top layer and we can make a microparticle. In a sense, it's, it's a platform technology that can be used to make different, different drug delivery systems. And the technology is completely scalable. In a sense, we can use just only single technology from phase one clinical trials to all the way to market scale manufacturing. And because it's so simple, we can use this for distributed manufacturing, right? For example, to give a simple case study, for example, if you look at our present COVID-19 vaccines, it's like a 0.5 ml dose, and we have 30 micrograms of mRNA, if it's a Pfizer vaccine, or it's 100 micrograms per mRNA. 
100 micrograms of mRNA if it is Moderna vaccine, right? To immunize the entire, entire global population of 8 billion, it takes five years and the production reads like five into 10 power five liters at the current rate, right? So on contrast, if you can use our chips at 100 liters per hour, at 100, sorry, at 100 liters per hour, just using 10 of our chips, we can make the lipid nanoparticles or whatever that is needed for the entire 8 billion people for two doses in less than three weeks. So that's how much the scalable. That means in a sense, all we need is like this kind of semiconductor technology-based chips, like 10 chips using the, using the design and fabricating techniques we developed. We can make this parallel manufacturing strategies in a distributed way, right? And currently um, we, just like last week, we received phase one funding from NSF, that's for 256K. And the topic is we worked on, uh, with, this is like on pharma manufacturing on a chip. And we just submitted a direct to phase two for NIH, which is for 2 million, that's under review. That's for vaccine manufacturing on a chip. And our goal at, this, at the moment, our goal is to raise another $3 million. The goal is, the, so we need to use those funds in a way that we don't want to give these kind of chips to our customers. The goal is the chip needs to be encapsulated in a tabletop version, right? Anybody with zero knowledge on the chip, they can just go and press the button and they can make the drug product that they want. So that's the idea that we are working on now. And this is our team, that's me. And uh, along in, in the team uh, with me, there are other two, two co-founders. They are professors at Penn Bioengineering. One is Professor Dayan Lee, and the other person is Professor David Isidore at Bioengineering. So that's all from, from, from my side. If, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take. Great, I think um, we have time for one question. Yeah. This is Barbara. Um, could you just identify how far along, do you have a prototype? I mean, what have you built and tested at this point? Yeah, we have built and tested pretty much like, um, we tested lipid nanoparticles and we tested PLGA long acting injectable drugs. And when you say you've tested it, what was the outcome that you measured? I mean, what was it capable of doing? Yes, so when we make, so for example, lipid nanoparticles, we made lipid nanoparticles, we, we see what is the uniformity of the lipid nanoparticles, what is the in vivo and in vitro activity. Okay, and okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, great, thank you so much. Um, and I think um, we'll move on to the next company. Um, feel free to continue to put your questions in the Q&A chat. Um, next, I'm very pleased to introduce Metal Life. Great. Hi everyone, my name is Minhal Dunji. I'm one of the co-founders of Metalite. We are undergoing a clean energy revolution, one that's powered by advances in macroelectricity generation from solar and wind technologies. But despite these advances, we're still lacking in innovations to produce clean energy locally. At Metalite, we're developing a portable power generation platform, one that is clean and sustainable, fueled by metal and air. To make that real, we're building the next generation of portable power generators, ones that are safe, sustainable, and scalable. Our generators emit zero emissions and are operable indoors and out. We use recycled or end-of-life aluminum sheets to enable continuous power output, and our technology can scale to power everything from a mobile phone to an entire home. And we can do all of this with our innovative metal harvesting technology. So a typical battery cell facilitates the reaction between the cathode and anode, but once that's depleted, it either needs to be recharged or disposed of entirely. Our technology enables us to replace the cathode with free oxygen in the air, similar to existing technologies, metal or batteries. But what's unique is we can re mechanically replace the metal anode with new metal sheets. So just like how a gasoline engine uses gas for fuel, 
we can use metal sheets to enable completely refuelable, continuous, and clean power generation. We've demonstrated this process with our prototype. Here, we can insert a metal cassette, suspend it, so while it's not in contact with our metal harvester, there are no parasitic losses. And it's only when we make contact, the battery cell is completed and instantaneous power is generated. Today, we scaled the technology that was invented in a perfect small scale condition at the University of Pennsylvania into a five watt LED prototype that you just saw in the previous GIF. In the next few months, we plan on scaling up the device into a 500 watt generator. And that's based off the current efficiencies we're generating in our lab today in the benchtop testing. Over the next few months, we're gonna refine the efficacy of our technology to improve the power output in that same size device unit to power a two kilowatt generator as our first go-to-market product. We're expecting at the very least, our product will last for about three hours with a single metal cassette. And what's unique is, again, we can refuel it continuously. So the, the product can generate power ongoing, on an ongoing basis for as long as needed. By combining that energy density and the refuelability of hydrocarbons with the flexibility and sustainability of batteries, our product is perfect for a variety of markets. We can bring real power generation indoors to millions of American homes. We can reach new customers with clean and quiet commercial portable power. And we can even provide over 1 billion people around the world access to clean electricity in off-grid communities. We're not just building a generator at Metal Light. We're building a global standard for clean portable power generation. Thank you. If you want to join us in our journey, feel free to contact us directly um, via our emails or um, in the network session after, but we're happy to take any questions now as well. Great, thank you. Uh, questions from the judges. Sure, this is Emily Minhall. Congratulations, this is excellent. Um, I'm very excited about the potential. So it seems like there's a there's a lot of potential here and markets you could go after. When you think about where you want to go first from a strategic perspective, what are you what are your thoughts? Yeah. So this, this first bucket of indoor power generation is really interesting to us, primarily because if you think about of an urban household, for example, I live in Philadelphia, I live in a brownstone in Center City. Um, if I needed some sort of backup generator, if my power went out, for example. What are my options available to me today? For most people, it's just get a gas generator. But if you live in an urban environment, you can't put that inside your home. Um, and I have no backyard, so there's nowhere for me to put it. Yeah. I could get a giant battery pack, like a lithium ion power station, but they last at max 45 minutes and they're very expensive, over $2,000. So really there's nothing available in the market to power homes indoors. And I think for us, that is a crucial beachhead market that enables us a, a customer base that wants a solution, but doesn't have anything available to them today. That's perfect, thank you. Um, you, you touched on it a little bit in your previous answer, but you talk about um, the cost of this device and if that cost changes when you go from sort of the medium power generator to a larger power generator. Yeah, um, I don't have the slide here, but Essentially, if you think about just how much it costs to build that generator, the, the beauty of our technology is it uses metal sheets as fuel. We have a, a hydrogel metal harvester, which is just essentially a saline solution, so salt, water, et cetera. So there's nothing really expensive about our technology. Um, if, you think, if you think about the pricing, right, we're estimating for that two kilowatt generator, a bomb of about $200. The vast majority of that comes from the power inverter which is because it's off the shelf, it's not custom for us. Um, a competing gas generator costs 1,000 at retail. A competing lithium ion power station costs 2,000. 
So we have significant flexibility in kind of where we price the product in the end retail market. We can either kind of go a little bit lower towards the gas side, or we can play, we are a clean premium product and go all the way up. Um, but based off our current margins, we have, we have a lot of flexibility there. Great, thanks. Um, any other questions at this point? Um, okay, if not, let's move on. Thank you again. Um, great to have you. And next, I'm pleased to bring up uh, Maya Red. Thank you. Uh, Maya a new startup at Penn, uh, we're focused on curing Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or DMD for short. It's a disease that represents a mountain of a problem really. And just as an arete is a very safe and efficient way to scale a mountain, we believe that Myoret's eutrophin based approach is the best path forward to developing a cure for DMD. Uh, by way of introduction, I had identified this protein uh, 30 odd years back at that time called DRP, dystrophin related protein. Uh, laid out the broad principles of uh, how this might uh, be achieved in terms of a therapy or converted into a therapy. And it's only recently that we've identified the small molecules that allow us to harness uh, the potential of eutrophin as a DMD therapy. And uh, what has led to the founding of MyoRet. Uh, along with me as founder, uh, we have Professor Donna Huron, who's a professor here at Penn and Pittsburgh, a medicinal chemist, and uh, Neil Lemon is obviously our contact for investor relations at DCI. And the disease is really a devastating one. Uh, typically kids uh, are in a wheelchair by 13 using a ventilator in their twenties and it's a hundred percent fatal. And this really underscores the enormous and uh, urgent unmet clinical need for this disease. The, the problems in Duchenne muscular dystrophy or the molecular pathology is that you have mutations in the gene you don't have dystrophin below the membrane leading to a dissolution of the complexes and basically holes punched in the membrane. And where eutrophin comes in is it's really a backup for dystrophin. So, you know, being from Philly, we like to say dystrophin's uh, quarterback and uh, starting quarterback and eutrophin's Nick Foles. And if it works really hard, it'll get you uh, a Super Bowl. Similarly, if you can upregulate eutrophin enough, it can take over the role of dystrophin, uh, recreate these complexes in the membrane and fix the holes and the problem. So at MyoRet, uh, our goal is eutrophin upregulation. We are focused uh, currently on doing it by small molecules. We have other things in the IP portfolio, but currently we're doing small molecules because they're the most tractable forward. Uh, for patients, uh, steroids, uh, there is competition and for patients, steroids are the mainstay but they're not really specific for the disease and they have a lot of side effects. Uh, exon skipping is available for a small minority of patients um, and it's not very effective. Gene therapy, you know, we hear about it a lot, but it's still in developmental stages. And we've heard about the problems with AVs and viruses in general in terms of immunity. W what I'll add is on the left side of the screen, all the dystrophin dependent approaches don't, aren't actually curative. They, they seek at best to convert Duchenne into a milder form of the disease called Becker muscular dystrophy. And this really distinguishes us and uh, provides the advantage that eutrophin has that it's a foundationally a curative disease, uh, uh, approach to the disease. And even additional benefits might be predicted uh, when added on, for instance, steroids and so forth. It is safe uh, because you're already making eutrophin and we're simply upregulating it. It would escape immune surveillance and there's no need for gene therapy. It's effective. It's a pharmacological small molecule approach. And importantly, it's universal. It could be used for all patients independent of mutations. Um, and the way we actually identified these small molecules was based on an innovation grant from the NIH, where we built a HDS platform for eutrophin and then obviously used advanced robotics to screen it with uh, small molecules. Uh, this is a pilot screen we initially did, um, which uh, led to our identification of a set of small molecules. And we took the top hit out of these and used it for in vivo proof of concept. And as you can see here, there's more protein uh, as expected. This did upregulate eutrophin. We saw increased strength in the mice. And importantly, we saw a decrease in um, 
the muscle damage that when we stretch the muscle. So where we are today is uh, we've done these screens. We've done another screen with a 100,000 molecule library, which is much richer in chemistry, chemical space and IP. We've identified some hits, uh, five hits, which we've uh, put through ADME for seeing the drug-like property. And, and Myoret is set to uh, look for the pre-IND and IND enabling studies. So we are currently seeking 5 million seed funding to go over the business infrastructure setup, two rounds of SAR uh, in vivo efficacy for a two year period where we expect to be able to uh, do a series A and start IND enabling for uh, eventual FDA filing with the breakthrough uh, designations. Uh, together, we'll be investing not just in developing a cure for DMD, but a better future for thousands of children with DMD. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, now on to our panelists. Um, it's very interesting. I is it possible to have too much eutrophin? Like if you upregulate it too much? Yeah, yeah so that's a, that's a great it? question. So transgenically in mice, they've upregulated it 50 fold and there's no uh, actually uh, side effects that were noted. So it's not like it's gonna act as a dominant negative. Okay, interesting. But then, and when you say it's curative, you're talking about it would have to be taken chronically. Yes, it or, would. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. but you think it might actually restore the muscle, not just stop progression? Uh, well, actually it would depend on the age at which you put it in, but basically even injured muscle would be uh, restored because it's basically a bit like um, SMN2 for SMA or fetal hemoglobin for uh, versus mm. adult hemoglobin. It has the same role. It's just expressed at really low pro uh, levels. That's the fundamental problem. Uh, just like hemoglobin will carry oxygen, this will do its job. It's just the uh, levels in adult uh, or postnatal are too low, and the small molecules will imp increase those levels. Related to that, the the dose and dosing schedule you used for the in vivo animals. Yeah, so this was uh, 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 this study. We actually calculated the KD from in vitro, and we did this for one month in mice. So this was a one month experiment, and it was done weekly. And this was actually a parenteral. It wasn't an oral dose. It, it was injected. Mm -hmm. I should say this small molecule is not what we're developing. This was actually already uh, from a pilot screen. The molecules which we plan to develop, we haven't tested in vivo because these are de novo new molecules. That's very helpful. Thank you. And then um, if you could just talk a little bit about the high throughput screen that you've developed and what makes it unique. Sure. The screen itself, um, uh, you know, is um, using standard HTS uh, um, uh, uh, sort of. What makes it unique is that we've taken the entire five prime and three prime ends of eutrophin. So they're all the regions that we expect, which would lead to a translational or post transcriptional activation. We're not interested in the promoter because uh, the promoter has actually been tried and it isn't very upregulatable. So by focusing it on the five and three prime UTRs, uh, what we're doing is looking for molecules that actually affect, uh, repress the repression. Most of eutrophin is actually actively repressed and these would seek to derepress it. So it's basically a problem that the brakes are sticky and this kind of fixes that problem. We, we're taking a feet off the brakes. It's very helpful, thanks. Okay, um, next, thank you so much. Um, that was great to have um, you participate. Um, and next we're moving on to Neonur. Oops, sorry about that. Hi, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present at Philly Peck Week. Neonor is a 
billion dollar opportunity to improve. Uh, we use um, med tech and AI driven to improve outcomes of high risk infants. We look at it by decreasing clinical risks and their stay in the NICU by quantifying what we call feeding biomarkers, which have been shown to track development. So um, neonatal intensive care has improved remarkably over the last two decades, saving lives, but not always with good outcomes. And these populations are at risk for the highest develop, high at risk, at the highest risk, excuse me, for developmental delays, and up to 50% of them have long-term complications. Most of them are kept in the hospital after other issues are managed as they transition from NG to oral feeding. The American Academy of Pediatrics recognizes that feeding competency is one of the top criteria for discharge. All of the other criteria are easily measured except for the developmental capability to safely orally feed. Feeding coordination is the only criteria dependent solely on clinical observation. And you ask, well, why is feeding so important? It's because it's very different for an infant than it is for an adult. Safe feeding is the coordination of sucking, swallowing, and breathing with respiration um, for minutes at a time, something that you and I as adults can't do. They do this continuously over long periods of time. It's a brainstem driven coordinated exercise that starts Early, late in gestation, so full term birth is about 38 to 40 weeks. It actually starts to be developed about 34 weeks. It's still aligned with their physiology. Um, and when you think about it, they have to suck and swallow and they have to protect their airway at the same time. At the same time, they may not even have the capability to cough. If you and I inhale liquid, we cough. Um, these babies can't do this. And we know that all of these skills are developmentally important. They're important, obviously, to prevent respiratory risks. They're also important to um, provide positive caloric balance. The most important thing a baby can do is grow. If they don't grow, they don't thrive. If it takes more energy to eat um, because they haven't developed this coordination, they actually lose weight. Um, it's also important for them, uh, for their later, later skills as they um, need to develop for solid feeding and speech. So Neonor provides the answer. This is a picture of our research device. Um, it measures suck, swallow, and respiration coordination, and it provides the clinician with information they don't currently have. It provides a graphical trace displaying what they already are used to. And these, uh, in the highest, center, highest level of centers, they have actually feeding specialists that do rounds um, with the care team. Um, and what they do is they feed the babies and they look for how are they coordinating suck, swallow, and breathing. So when we show them these graphs that just show what we're measuring, that, that what they're trying to look at, they're excited by that information alone. We then take that information and we extract using signal processing analysis um, measurements. Um, and then we compare those to historic norms. We've got over $5 million worth of research out of CHOP and UPenn um, that have collected data using these signals. Um, that we can then compare them to, much like a weight curve is compared uh, for pediatric infants. And they do this over time. So um, like you're tracking weight as a developmental assessment, here we're using feeding as a developmental assessment. And you can do this at birth. And what's really exciting about this is we actually have data looking at six and 12 month developmental delays using the same data. But initially we're gonna look at how do we improve feeding transitions because we're improving clinical care, we're preventing respiratory risk, we're, we're preventing um, issues that lead to failure to thrive. And along the way, we're also identifying developmental needs. So upgrading the UNOR for daily use, which is what we're doing currently, will enable earlier, safer discharge and better continuity of care. Everyone wants to discharge these babies earlier but they're kept in the hospital because the best means they, they can evaluate how these babies are progressing is actually by physical observation. And we're providing a tool that will enable these babies to be discharged earlier and safer. Currently, 40% of readmissions are due to feeding issues um, and failure to thrive. If we can prevent the readmissions, but also provide a safe means to monitor these babies earlier, we get the best of both worlds. Um, Neonor was founded in 2019, and I think achievements really um, add to where we're going and build upon the mo build momentum. 
in 2019, we incorporated, we licensed the, the technology from Penn. We won and were finalists in several grant competitions. We sold three years research devices. Um, and well, I think everybody knows in 2020 there was COVID, but we still raised funds. Uh, and uh, we won a prestigious FDA Pediatric Device Consortium Award. Um, we've got researchers who want our device who were delayed due to COVID, um, and we're still in communication with them. And we got an FDA uh, meeting um, providing us feedback on where we need to go with our device, and they actually want to know when, when we can have this device ready for submit. So we've really accelerated our work on uh, transitioning to a clinical design. We expect to have that design completed this year and, and submit later this year and hopefully launch in 2022. Um, uh, great, that's about all the time we have. So I wanted to pause you there and go to questions. Um, Carolyn, could you just say how much money you're, uh, wait, yeah, I don't think you said how much money you're raising and where it gets you. Yep. Nope. We um, we're we're seeking. We've raised two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We're raising another uh, four hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars seed funding. Um, that will get us um, really. That will get us all the way to launch. Um, but it will not provide us with the funds that we'll need um, into launch and to build inventory. Margalit, I have other questions. If but your turn. just one. Um... What, uh, what data points would you need to show for at, at the end of a clinical trial, let's say, to get a device like this FDA approved? I'm, I'm sorry, ask the question again, please. What data points or what endpoints would you need to show um, at the end of, at a clinical yeah. trial to so get a need, device like this approved? Yeah, so we met with the FDA. We already have um, about 1,200 patients worth of clinical data already in our files. Um, and we shared that data with them. And we do, we, we do not anticipate needing any additional clinical trials. What but what endpoints were they looking for to get it for, for yeah, approval? Right. So so this is um, unlike a therapeutic. Our endpoints are softer in that we are more like a diagnostic. And so what they're looking is for clinical utility, and that's what our we have an SBIR that we've filed um, that is all about really gaining input on the from the clinicians about clinical utility and how they'll use it. Um, so so far we have you know we had a um, an I Corps grant. We interviewed over 150. Um, users, um, and they indicated that they would use the device now because they have no means to quantify um, anything really about how these babies are feeding and if they're neurologically developed enough to safely um, progress. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thanks to all of you. Um, we have to move on now to uh, our last company presenting today, School Sims. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Adolph Krentar. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of School Sims. And we are a software as a service company that focuses on the education technology sector. Um, and what we do is we provide simulation software to school stakeholders, which helps them to manufacture experiences that they can tap into when they're facing a challenging situation. Um, the product idea came around in 2014. But we really started to kick things off in late 2019 as we formed a management team and really built a company around the idea, added employees, and really started our marketing and sales engine. Um, the reason that this product was founded was really because the job of the principal has become really complex in schools, and it's led to a lot of churn. So principals are coming into the job um, unprepared and or underprepared at least. And once they're in the job, they're really lacking continuing professional development opportunities. And it leads to principals staying in the job for less than four years. And it's even worse in underserved areas. And that really has a significantly negative impact on student achievement. Teachers and principals rank one as two as being the most important in impacting student achievement. And when the principals are having issues staying in their building, it's impacting teachers as well. Principals are responsible for helping to hire the teachers, grow the teachers, develop the teachers. So we have a real um, problem in schools right now. So we developed the School Sim solution, um, which is simulation software. And it's 
it includes true actors. So you get an opportunity to really experience what's going on in a scenario and feel the pain of a teacher as a principal playing through the simulation, for example, or feel um, you know, the situation that a parent is experiencing or a child or a superintendent. And each simulation has six to 10 decision points. And what's really great about this software is that at a decision point, there's no happy path solution. You are going to need to experience consequences. You can't make every you're in a situation happy. Um, everyone has varying agendas. So you're going to have to deal with the consequences after a decision and potentially recover from those consequences. So these simulations are really well received and they're working great in K-12 as well as higher ed um, in terms of training aspiring principals and aspiring teachers. So simulations are known to be effective in high stake industries like medical, piloting, et cetera. And we feel like um, you know, education is also a high stake industry. We're you know, creating the future of, of these students and, and trying to build opportunities for them. And uh, you know, we do, need to do a better job preparing the leaders um, in those schools. In terms of the company, we have about 110 clients right now. Um, we, uh, it's about 30% higher ed and the rest is K-12 districts. We're pushing hard towards a million dollars in recurring bookings. Um, we grew 155% last year, despite um, COVID. We're projecting about 70% this year and we have strong retention as well. And you'll see here a mix of our um, clients, higher ed and, um, and K-12. And then here's our management team and Ken Spiro is our founder. So he worked closely with um, Mike Johannick at University of Pennsylvania to develop these simulations um, and is a simulation expert um, from the corporate world. So he brought his experience from corporate simulations into ed tech. And we believe there's an opportunity um, for expansion in other sectors um, once we you know, finish our focus in ed tech. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Panelists. Hi, this is Emily. Um, Brian, thanks for submitting. I have to have a, a bit of experience in this space um, just from an ed tech uh, company I was at prior to my current role. And so this is excellent what you've built. I was wondering, um, what is the cost structure of the, the people behind the scene? So how much do you, you have to pay for them to do, to do the simulations? Yeah, um, so we have been working through that since I've been with the company around um, September 2019. Um, it used to be that it would cost us about $12,000 to produce two sims. And the reason it's two sims is because we try to fit two sims into a session in a day. Um, but we have that um, down um, a little bit now this year so far. Um, though, to be honest, it's been hard to produce media during um, COVID Zoom videos, which have actually been well received. So it's opened up some new paths for us potentially. But what we're doing is trying to find a true partner um, for production where we can commit to um, you know, the simulation production um, that we need for that year and have ideally the same actors and really tell a story inside of our simulations versus having a different group of people for each simulation. So um, it's TBD and something we're working on, um, but we hope that our spend is around $50,000 a year to produce the media we need for this, all of the simulations. That's great. And, and what are the costs for the school? Well, two questions. So for the Higher ed, I'm assuming that's for graduate schools of education to train administrators and teachers. So it's for graduate programs and doctoral programs for aspiring leaders in schools. And we've just branched into the teacher side. So the undergraduate programs as well. Great. And, and what's the cost structure for the schools versus districts or are they the same? So we really sell into districts or higher ed. We're not selling individual schools right now. Um, that's not our goal. Um, we've also sold it to state departments of education, um, which is really nice. Um, so our ACB right now is about 7,500 for both. Um, we're not 100% sure that that's right. Um, with this being my first full year, we're still collecting some data points, to be honest. 
Um, but in addition to um, the, you know, the annual contract that we have, um, something that's been working well, especially in higher ed, has been what we call student pay, um, where the participants, the, the university students, are buying our simulations just like they would a textbook. That's great. Well, thank you. Congrats on everything. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to the panelists. And um, now I'm going to hand it back to Danielle. Yeah, uh, so thanks so much, Lori and, and John for your support of, of this program and, and for bringing these amazing companies and, and company presentations uh, to us today for this, our first Philly Tech Week event of 2021 for, for PACT and for Penn. 